We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you guys today. Like Joanna said, my name's Elliot. I'm the Connection Pastor here. And this summer, we have been working our way through a passage of Scripture known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is found in um, the book of Matthew. Matthew is one of four biographies about the life of Jesus included in the Bible. And this um, sermon by Jesus is found in Matthew 5 through 7. Now, there are parts of this sermon that are included in some of the other Gospels, and so you find these teachings in other places. But this is the place where they took the time to write out the sermon in its entirety. And so we've been marching through this sermon, and as you study it, and as you consider world history and people that have learned from this and taken this and put it into practice, you realize that these teachings of Jesus have impacted the world in profound ways. So we're calling this the Divine Conspiracy, and the reason that we... Um, chose this title is because a conspiracy is a plan to bring change that's implemented behind the scenes. And what you realize is God's plan to bring change into the world is a behind-the-scenes plan where he's flipping the world upside down. Actually, he's flipping the world right side up, but because we're so used to living in this upside-down world, we think that upside-down is the way that life is supposed to be. So that's why Jesus came and he made statements like this in Luke 16. He says, what people value highly is detestable in the sight of God. The idea is, is if you made a list of all the things that we value and you ranked them, this is number one, this is number two, like, you know, personal freedom, comfort. I mean, you just go on and down the list, financial security. And you made this list of these are, we agree, these are the absolute most important things to live for in life. If you made this list and you ranked it, and then you reversed the list and you flipped it over, you start to get an idea of what God says is actually really important. It's very shocking stuff that Jesus says. So when he starts the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts with multiple shocking statements, statements like this. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, we usually don't think of the poor in spirit, the people that are at the end of their road, or the people who are meek. We don't think of those people as the people who are living the good life. Usually what we think is we think the people who are confident and self-sufficient and driven and have a clear direction for their life, we usually think that those are the people that are on the path to the good life. But what Jesus does is he comes, and in very shocking ways, he flips it over. And what he calls this right-side-up way of living that he presents, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. When somebody lives according to God's ways, what they're doing is they're living in the kingdom of heaven. God's rule and reign lived out here on earth in present day. So if part of this plan that Jesus has of flipping the world right-side-up What Jesus instructs us, his followers, to do is he wants us to be salt and light. What salt is, is salt is a way of living different from the culture around us in a way that's appealing. And then light is pointing back to the one who's changed us. So being open and honest about our faith and the change that Jesus is bringing in our life so that other people can decide to follow him as well. And then after this instruction to be salt and light, what Jesus does in his sermon is he makes a series of statements about how people normally live life. He says, you've heard that it was said, over and over. He says, references things. You've heard it was said to do this, and you've heard that it was said that you're supposed to do this. These normal approaches to life. And then Jesus reverses it, and he says, but actually what I want you to do is live differently. And so a series of shocking illustrations that are revealing how somebody who's living according to the values of the kingdom of heaven and drawing their power from God how they live. And as you study these statements that he makes, it becomes really obvious that you can only live the values of the kingdom of heaven if you rely on God's grace. So as we go through this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, it's helpful to understand, okay, Jesus is presenting a way of life that is foreign to us, a way that it seems upside down, but it's actually right side up. And then Jesus calls us to live differently, to be salt and light. And then he gives these series of illustrations, and the illustrations are making the point that We can't do this on willpower. We have to rely on him. If we don't draw our power from him, 
we just can't sustain this way of living. To live in the kingdom and live the values of the kingdom, you have to rely on God's grace. So today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up the first section of this sermon, and we're going to look at two statements that Jesus makes where he talks about how to deal with enemies and how to deal with people who intentionally wrong you. Not just they bumped into you and they offended you, but actually their intent was to hurt you or to offend you or to upset you in some way. They intentionally wrong you. How do you deal with people in those situations? A couple days ago, I was driving, and um, as I'm driving along, there's a car in the lane next to me, and on the back of the car, there was a vulgar statement that was painted on the back of the car. And it wasn't just like, you know, they had a dirty window and somebody was kind of being funny and came along and wrote something in the dust on the window. It was actually a part of the design of the car, this vulgar statement. And I was driving alone, which I was glad about because I've got two kids now that can read. And as a parent, I really didn't want to explain that because I know what my kids would have said. They would have said, Dad, what does that mean? And I'm, I didn't want to explain it. So I, you know, as I'm driving, I'm like, I'm glad I'm alone. And I kind of, you know, I, I kind of judged the guy. I was like, come on, man, like, we don't need to be putting that on our cars. So I, I drive past, my lane was moving faster. And after a while, my lane um, ended because of construction, so we all had to merge. So me and all the cars around me, we turn our blinkers on, we start to merge. And there was a little bit of room, and so I kind of start to ease over into the lane next to me. And as I'm doing that, the car who's coming, they just accelerate, and they box me up. So I'm like, okay, well, that was kind of rude. You didn't need to do that. So then I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, now it's my turn, so I'm easing over. My, my passenger side tires are in the other lane, because I've got to get over, so I'm going over. Well, right behind that first car is the car with the vulgar statement. He does the exact same thing. He accelerates right past me. And now I'm like, okay, I almost honk. I decided not to honk, you know, show some self-control. I don't honk. Thankfully, the car behind him lets me in, so I get in behind him. And I'm like, okay, it's no big deal, you know, we're going to get where I want to go. Then I realize out of his side mirror, he's glaring at me. He's giving me a dirty look. What, is, what in the world is with this guy? I mean, I didn't paint that on my car. He painted it. I didn't say anything to him. I haven't done anything to him. I didn't box him out. He boxed me out. Now he's giving me a dirty look. Who does this guy think he is? So that all of a sudden, the sense of an injustice and anger, it started to well up on the inside, and somebody needs to do something about this guy. <laughs> and we all, we all know this feeling. Check out what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 5. He says, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, to understand what Jesus is saying here in this passage, we need to clarify what Jesus is not saying, because there's often confusion about the point that Jesus is making. And I think that one of the reasons for the confusion is because what Jesus is saying hits so close to home. And what he's saying is something that really deep down at a heart level, oftentimes we don't want to do this. So we try to excuse our way out of it by saying, oh, well, Jesus is talking about this extreme example, and of course I couldn't do it in that situation. So what is Jesus not saying? Well, when Jesus says, do not resist an evil person, Jesus is not talking about the Osama bin Ladens and the Hitlers of the world. The word evil here that he uses is a Greek word that means to hurt, and it refers to hurt or an offense caused on the personal level. So Jesus is not saying that crime should not be punished, God has made it clear in the Bible that one of the primary functions of government is to punish crime, and the consequence for crime needs to be fitting. It needs to be in proportion to the crime that was committed. That's what we refer to as just, and actually the consequence needs to be relatively swift so that the society, the people watching, the people engaging in this behavior and then see the consequences know that this is a big deal and this is something to be avoided. 
So the Bible has already made that really clear. So Jesus isn't talking about that. This is a passage where Jesus is talking about evil on the personal level, not the national level. Also, when Jesus refers to enemies, notice how he contrasts enemies with neighbors. So these are people that you have a relationship with. Jesus is talking about situations where another person intentionally wrongs or mistreats you. He refers to situations where someone insults you or they want something from you and they're being so petty that they're willing to go to court to get this thing from you or someone who has power and they use their position and their power to to force you to do something that they should do for themselves. So what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about personal relationship warfare, a topic that we know really well. And when it comes to relational, personal relational warfare, there are some predictable responses. When somebody wrongs you, especially when they intentionally wrong you, it's not just, you know, they bumped into you, they didn't mean to, it was an accident, but somebody, they actually have their heart set on doing something that's going to hurt you. When this happens, we know the predictable response. The predictable response is to retaliate, to get even, to do to them what they did to you. This is why Jesus quotes the ancient saying, and he says, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. They take an eye, you take an eye. They take a tooth, you take a tooth. They cut you off for no reason and give you a dirty look in traffic. Well, you figure out a way to cut them off and give them a dirty look in traffic. I mean, do to them what they did to you. This is the predictable response. This is the normal way that we respond to personal relationship warfare. The problem is, is this response never solves the conflict. And really, there's several problems, but two of the problems that I want to point out is, first of all, when you choose this response, it's never over. An eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth never solves the problem. It actually only escalates things and makes things worse. You know, I see this in my kids. You know, one kid is playing, and the other kid comes in, and, you know, they're starting to play together, and then one of them gets mad, so they take the toy, they whack the uh, the first one with it. The second one responds, takes a toy, whacks their sibling with it, Never have I heard my kids say, you know what, when you hit me, that was equal to me hitting you. Let's just call it even, and let's go back to playing and have a great time. (laughs) My kids have never done that, nor will they ever do that. It only escalates. The fight gets worse, and then one of them comes running to me or Allie, their mom, saying, you'll never believe what they did to me. It only escalates. So this approach, it, it never solves the problem. It's never over. The second reason that this problem, this approach doesn't solve the problem is because conflict is never rational. Rational people don't want to be hurt. But how rational are you when you're angry? You know, we see this play out in sports all the time. One player does something to another player that the first player doesn't like. There's retaliation. There's revenge. They get even. You see the fight ensue. In the moment, on a regular basis, we see players make decisions that could cost their team the chance to win the game, that could get them ejected, get them suspended, cost them thousands of dollars in, fine, in fines because of the emotion of the moment. I mean, think about it. How logical is it to punch someone in the head who's wearing a helmet with a face mask that protects their head and face? It's not rational. But we see this play out all the time because of the emotion in the moment. They wronged me. There needs to be justice. Somebody needs to set this right. I need to do something about this. And you see this same thing play out in families. You see it play out in businesses. You see it play out in neighborhoods whenever there's conflict. So this approach that Jesus points out, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, this approach never solves the problem. So in response to these situations... What Jesus does in these illustrations of this passage is he's revealing a strategy and he's illustrating tactics for how someone who's living according to the values of the kingdom of heaven and relying on God's power, how they respond. Strategies are a plan of action to get you to a destination. That's what a strategy is. Tactics are the specific steps taken to accomplish the strategy. The strategy is the what, and the tactics are the how. So if we were thinking in military terms, the general might say, the strategy is to take that hill. And then the tactics are the specific ways that we're going to take the hill. How are we going to approach it? Where are we going to go up? Who's going to lead? Those are the tactics. The strategy is the what, the tactics are the how. 
That's what Jesus is revealing. He's saying when you enter into personal relational warfare, instead of retaliation or revenge or getting even, I'm going to give you tactics and a strategy behind the tactics for how you can navigate this situation. So let's look at the tactics. This is the first thing Jesus speaks to. When it comes to relational warfare, the tactics of the kingdom of heaven are to surprise the other person with good. The tactics are to surprise with good. When people intentionally hurt you, instead of retaliating, instead of revenge, instead of getting even, if you choose the tactics of surprise by doing something good, what it does is it gives their evil nowhere to hide. Their intention to hurt you is now exposed. And this is important because what evil expects is evil expects compliance or resistance. And if you comply with their evil actions, what you're communicating is that their evil approach is an effective approach. We are, we're pretty pragmatic people. We, over time, even if we know something's wrong, but if it gets us the results that we want, over time, we, we start to believe, well, it must not be that bad because it's getting me what I want. So if a person is choosing to mistreat others to get what they want and they're doing this on purpose and everybody just complies and goes along with it, then over time this person starts to think, well, it must not be that bad because it's an effective strategy. It's working for me. So we don't comply with it. And we also, evil expects resistance. But if you resist, especially in personal relationships, if you turn and you fight back, well, now their evil feels justified because now they're fighting something that they deem to be evil which would be your aggressive, combative response to what they did to hurt you. But if you choose the tactics of surprising to do good to the other person, well, then their evil is exposed. And now, because they were expecting compliance or resistance, but you've surprised them by doing something good for them, now they're left scratching their head asking, what in the world's going on here? Because it's not what they expected. So Jesus illustrates this in four ways. He gives four illustrations of how somebody who's living according to the values of the kingdom of heaven, who's relying on God's power, four ways that they respond with the tactics of doing good. And I'll warn you, as I go through these, we hear these and they just sound extreme. It sounds like, what in the world is Jesus talking about? But as I go through this, and then as we get into the strategy, I think that this will start to make a lot of sense. So the first illustration he gives is he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. Now, what Jesus is not saying is he's not saying to just let people beat us up. He's also not saying, okay, give them one cheek and then give them the other cheek and then let the fists fly. That's not what Jesus is saying. In Jesus' day, a slap was an insult. You know, so in our day, turning the other cheek might be responding to someone insulting you, calling you a name, something mean about you, trying to intentionally hurt you, put you down, might be responding by asking for input. Not in a sarcastic way, not as a smart aleck, not to publicly make them look stupid, but just, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, responding to their insult and saying, hey, I can tell that what I did really upset you. Can you help me understand so that if there's something that I need to change, I can change it? I mean, that's surprising. You have just put them on their heels. What they meant to hurt you and to offend you and to put you down and to wound you, now you're saying, hey, if there's something for me to learn, could you, could you tell me what it is so that I can learn it? You just put them on their heels. That's surprising. You're responding to the insult by asking for input. Next, Jesus says, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Jesus is not saying that we should never defend ourselves in court. But the category that he's speaking to is a small injustice. Someone is so upset with you that they're willing to take you to court for a shirt. And we know that's not right. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. It's like, what, why are you willing to pay this money to go to court for something so small? And as extreme as this sounds, unfortunately, this is something that happens in families quite often. You see individuals and families get so upset with each other that they're willing to go to court over relatively small things. So Jesus says, don't go to war over a shirt. I mean, what he's pointing out is if somebody, the, the person in this situation, they have a need. The need is they, they want this shirt. They need this thing. And so Jesus is saying, hey, instead of going to court, identify what their need is and then meet their need. So if their need in this situation is clothing and he's saying, and you've got some clothing, 
well, why don't you just go ahead and say, hey, you really want this shirt, here's the shirt, and just because I've got a little more, here's a coat as well. I mean, shocking. Puts the other person on their heels, completely exposes their motivation. So you respond to a small injustice by giving a gift. Next, he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You know, in, in Jesus' day, this is a reference to what Roman soldiers would do. They would travel through a town, and when they would get into the town, they could require the citizens to carry their packs for up to one mile. Now, the people in this region of the world, the nation of Israel was a conquered nation, so they were living under oppressive Roman rule. So this was humiliating. This was infuriating that the Romans had this authority to come in and force them to do this thing. Now, we don't live in this situation. Nobody's walking up to us and commanding us to carry their pack for a mile. But in our day, this might look like a boss who maybe they use their power, their position, to force you to do work that you didn't sign up for, to force you to do work that's not part of your job description. And the normal response in that situation is you start to resent the boss and grow bitter. And maybe even you're in a situation where you know, your coworkers kind of laugh about, ha ha, he's making you do that again. You know, so that we, it, it's humiliating. It's embarrassing. Jesus' response says, hey, why don't you serve the other person? Instead of getting resentful and bitter about it, why don't you do the work and then ask the question, are there more ways that I can help? This isn't a doormat. It's not a, okay, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, just let you walk all over me. This is saying, okay, you're asking me to do this thing, I'll do it, and if you need more help, let me know what that is, because I want to help you, and I want to do it with a good attitude. Again, this is very, very surprising. This is not what we expect. Final thing Jesus says is he says, give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, it's important to note, Jesus says this at the end of three illustrations of people who have just wronged you. So now the person who's coming to you and asking for you to give them something, the person who's coming now with a need, this is a person who they've insulted you, they've, gone, they've been incredibly petty with you to the point of willing to take you to court, they have wronged you in some way, they've used force against you. This is the person who's just done that and now they're coming to you needing something. This isn't saying that every time somebody asks you for money, you have to get it, give it. If you did that, you couldn't take care of your responsibilities. This is the person who wronged you, who now has a need and they need something from you. Usually what we call this is we call this payback time. And this is the opportunity to get even, to gloat, to celebrate at their misfortune, to rub it in. You think after what you did to me, I'm going to help you? Who do you think you are? I'm not going to help you. I mean, this is the opportunity. But what, is, what does Jesus say? He says, hey, they come to you with a need, and he says, help them out. If they need money, give them money. Loan them some money. Maybe if money's just going to make the problem worse, don't give them money. Maybe give them something else. Identify what the need is and help them out. I mean, just imagine doing one of these things. Just imagine with a person that you're in personal relational warfare with, somebody that you know you're in a relationship with, they've wronged you. Just imagine choosing this response in that situation. This is shocking. What you're doing is you're putting the other person on their heels. You're communicating that the other person is more important than the conflict. You're communicating that you're living by a different set of values. The normal approach of retaliation and revenge, that's not what governs you. The approach of, hey, life is all about me getting justice and things being the way that they're supposed to be. It has to be fair. It has to be right. I have to get what's mine. You're saying, I don't live by that standard. So I'm not going to treat you by that standard. So even if you treat me that way, you know, I live by a different set of rules. And so I'm going to let those rules dictate how I treat you. So I'm going to surprise you, and I'm actually going to do something good. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to learn from this situation. I'm going to do something good that benefits you. You have just put them on their heels, and now they're scratching their head because that is not what they expected. The reason we choose this, these tactics, the reason Jesus illustrates it this way, it's because of the next thing that he talks about. He talks about the strategy. The strategy behind these tactics, the strategy of the kingdom of heaven, is love. Now, on the surface, love as a strategy 
when dealing with people who intentionally hurt you, that sounds like a crazy strategy. It actually sounds like a weak strategy. It sounds ineffective. It's like, is this even going to do anything? Is this, is this really going to work? That's the question that we ask. And we struggle with this approach because, one, we don't understand what's required for a heart to change, and also, we have a misunderstanding of love. We, deep down, we often believe that what will get someone else to change is a use of force, or a, a show of anger, a display of, of, of power in some way. We think that's really going to get another person to change. That might get them to conform their behavior to our wishes, but that's not going to bring change at a heart level. So we have a misunderstanding of what's going to get a heart to change, and we also have a misunderstanding of what love is. Because when we think of love, we think it's this kind of warm, fuzzy, good feeling. And we don't think of all the, the practical things that are behind love. So what Jesus is saying when he's saying this is we push back against it often because of our wrong ideas. So check out again what Jesus says. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43, he says, You've heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So what he's saying is the reason that we're supposed to love our enemies is because that's the strategy that God has chosen. When somebody chooses to live against God's instructions, to rebel against him, to live opposite to what he's said to do, to live in opposition. When somebody chooses to do that, God doesn't withhold his blessing. It points out here one of the ways God blesses them. He says that it, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So just because somebody's in opposition to God, God doesn't block the sun from shining on their property or the rain from falling on their yard. He continues to extend his kindness. And this is a form of God's kindness that we often take for granted. But if you just sit and think about it for a minute, what are all the ways, just a few of the ways, what are the ways that you could think of that our lives are blessed by the sun shining and the rain falling? I mean, just a few, for example, the sun. The sun helps our bodies produce vitamin D. Vitamin D has so many health benefits, benefits us in so many ways, it's referred to as a super nutrient. Sunlight, just going outside, getting some sunlight, increases the release of serotonin which can boost a person's mood and improve their ability to focus. Just by going outside and getting in the sun, our body functions better. We think clearer just by getting some sunlight. Sunlight's also needed to keep our bodies warm. It helps us keep track of time. The rain gives us fresh water to drink. You combine the rain and the sun, and it allows plants to grow, which gives us healthy air to breathe and food to eat. I mean, you could keep going on and on down the list. Just by pointing out, he's saying, hey, he allows his sun to shine and the rain to fall on everybody, the righteous and the unrighteous. He's saying, hey, God, it, these aren't small blessings. These are massive blessings in very practical, tangible ways that benefit human flourishing. And he, he doesn't limit it. And this isn't the way that we would do it. I mean, if it was up to me, you know, and I controlled the, the sun and I controlled the rain, you would know just by driving down my street who I was in conflict with. Because you would turn the corner, and it would just be, you know, the, the, whoever the enemy was, it would be just a dead yard, and there would just be this massive black cloud hanging over there. They would have no sunlight, just be shrouded in darkness. I mean, you would just know instantly of, oh, Elliot and that person must be in conflict. That's how we would do it. But that's not what God does. God continues to bless those who follow him, and also those are his enemies. So why does God choose this strategy of love? Well, Romans 2.4 says it this way. It says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. What repentance is, is it's a decision to turn around. It's a decision to freely choose to change and adopt a new approach to life. You know, if God used a show of force, God would change our behavior. If God just, you know, every time we did something wrong, just boom, lightning showed up. Our behavior would definitely change. But our hard hearts wouldn't crack open for us to change at a heart level. 
that wouldn't change. God knows that the only thing that will crack open our hearts so we can choose a new path is love. And God also knows that this strategy, it's a risky strategy because some people are going to view it as weak. Some people are going to reject it. But God also knows that this is the only strategy that works. It's the only strategy that has a, that has a chance of changing a heart. It's actually the whole verse of Romans 2, 4 says it this way. It says, or do you, talking to people who claim to follow God, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? It was kind of a warning for those of us who follow God that, like, don't, don't look down on his strategy. Don't view it as weak and ineffective. I mean, this is the strategy that God has chosen. This is the strategy, the only strategy that has a chance to change a human heart, to bring about true repentance. There's something to me that's really fascinating in this is right after he says, love your enemies, he says what might be the most shocking thing in the passage, he says, pray for those who persecute you. The word persecute means to chase. These are people who are out to get you. They're specifically looking for opportunities to hurt you or to get even with you or to do something. He's saying, pray for those who are out to get us. And we know that when he says, pray for those who persecute you, we know that these are not prayers of annihilation. We know that he's not saying, hey, pray, you know, God, would you destroy this person? Would you humiliate them? Would you multiply their suffering and make them the scum of the earth? We know that that's not what he's talking about. We know that these are actually prayers for their good. And one of the reasons we know that is because that's what Jesus did. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's given his perfect divine life for sin. The crowd's mocking him. They've lied about him. They've falsely accused him. Now they're celebrating as he's hanging there dying for something that he didn't do. Check out Jesus' prayer, Luke 23. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You know, the best thing that somebody can experience in this life is receiving forgiveness from God. That is the absolute best thing that somebody can experience in this life. That's our one chance to, to experience it. We're eternal beings. We're going to live forever. There is going to be a destination for us for all of eternity. This is our chance to, first, to receive forgiveness, which determines our eternal destiny. This is the best thing. So Jesus is looking out at this crowd that's mocking him, making fun of him, ridiculing him. You call yourself the son of God. You can't even come off the tree. And his prayer is for their best. He does the exact same thing he tells us to do. He doesn't just say, hey, I want you guys to choose this strategy and here's the tactics. He then spends his whole life living it out. Here's how you do it. So for me, one of the things that I realize is if I'm going to choose this strategy and these tactics, which are incredibly hard to do, even relying on God's power to do this, it's still a struggle to choose to do these things. What I realize is one of the only things that gets me a chance to actually live the way Jesus is illustrating here in this passage is if I remember that the sins that nailed Jesus to the cross, the reason he's hanging there, weren't just the sins of the crowd that was standing in front of him mocking him that day. My sins also put Jesus on that cross. There's a time in my life when I was an enemy of God, when I thought the ways of God were a joke, when I was willfully living in rebellion against him. And the, the strategy that he chose with me, with Elliot, was a strategy of love. And the tactics that he chose with me were not, he didn't respond to me the way that I responded to him. He didn't do to me the things that I did to him. He decided, I'm going to bring good into Elliot's life. And those good things over time, those cracked my heart open so that I could choose to repent and follow him. So if it wasn't for him choosing a strategy of love and for him choosing the tactics of surprising by bringing good into my life, even good in the form of the sun shining and the rain falling, if he wouldn't have done that, there's no way that I would have chosen to follow him. So then what he does is now he invites me. He says, hey, Elliot, these strategy, this strategy and these tactics, they worked on you. Now, why don't you join me in this? Why don't you be a part of, instead of making situations worse and continuing the conflict, why don't now you rely on me and choose these stra the strategy and the tactics that I used with you, and why don't you use them on other people? 
This is why the last thing that Jesus says in this passage, Matthew 5, 48, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is often so confusing because people think God is telling us to be, to be something that we can't be. He's saying, we think that he's giving us the impossible, but he's not. Remember, this is in the context of how to respond to enemies. So he's just revealed to us that with us, he chose the perfect strategy, and with us, he chose the perfect tactics. So now he says, hey, that's how I deal with my enemies. So you've got enemies, you've got people that you're in relational warfare with, choose my strategy, choose my tactics. That's the perfect tactic, the perfect strategy when it comes to that situation. They worked on you, they'll work on other people too. I love the way that Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message paraphrase, he says it this way as he wraps up this passage. He says, you're kingdom subjects. You're part of the kingdom of heaven. God saved you. You're members of the kingdom of heaven. You're kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live differently. He's invited you to live in this upside down world. Now start to live it. Start to live in a right side up. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect is an invitation to choose his strategy of love and to choose the tactics of surprising the other person with good, even when they intentionally wrong us. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you chose the strategy of love. I thank you that in your wisdom, you knew that that was the only strategy that would work, the only strategy that would create an environment where a heart could freely choose to change. And I thank you for choosing it. And I thank you for the tactics. The tactics have looked different in each one of our lives, but you've chosen tactics in our lives to bring us good that we don't deserve. The, the good could be the sun shining, the rain falling, the families that we're born into, the people that you connect us with, the skills and the blessings that you give us, but you've chosen to give us good things, things that we don't deserve. So God, I pray that we wouldn't look at those things as, as weak, we wouldn't look down on those things, but I pray that those things would soften our heart and we would realize that you've loved us and that's what's created an opportunity for change. And then in response to the people who wrong us, even the people who intentionally wrong us, we would surprise them by responding the way that you responded to us. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name.